Hi there everyone, uh, good to see you this evening. Uh, my name is Andy Bailey from Dartmoor National Park and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you this evening to tonight's talk, which is all about discovering Dartmoor's rainforests. Shortly we're going to be joined by Kate Hine from Plant Life, uh, but before we do, uh, just let me give you a few uh, messages. Uh, so just as everybody is arriving now, it's only just turned seven o'clock, um, if you want to keep in touch with us through the course of tonight's talk, then you can use the live chat, uh, which is in the YouTube channel next to the video you're watching. If you don't want to use the uh, live chat, then you can email us as well at education at dartmoor.gov.uk and that uh, is on the screen now so you can see the the details for that. I'll keep an eye on the live chat and I'll keep an eye on the um, on the uh, emails and then I will uh, bring those questions to Kate at the end of tonight's session. Uh, so hopefully you can all hear me. Last week we had a, an issue with my sound but it looks like it's all loud and clear so I'm hoping uh, that you can all hear me. Uh, Nobody's said anything in the live chat yet, so that is good. It means that uh, there's no panic at the moment. Um, so uh, hopefully you're all full of the joys of spring at the moment. Uh, the sun is shining here and I'm um, well, not in this picture, but it is in my real world outside the window here. Uh, and I can see all the leaves are beginning to burst out onto the trees. Uh, the blossom is out and I get a real sense that spring is here. I've been enjoying the Dawn Chorus and uh, those of you who've not got, uh, got out and enjoyed that yet, uh, I urge you to do so. It is uh, one of nature's spectacles. I went out uh, a week or so ago with John White from the RSPB uh, and had a great time at Yarna Wood. Uh, and if you want to uh, catch up with how we got on, then you can see that on our YouTube channel uh, later. OK, so tonight's talk is all about uh, Dartmoor's uh, rainforests. I'm um, also just keeping an eye on the... Uh, someone's just told me they've not received the link. I'll just send them that in a second. Uh, so tonight's talk is all about uh, Dartmoor's rainforests uh, and in particular uh, those smaller plants that are often overlooked uh, when we go in amongst those woods. So I'm hoping that Kate is going to bring that hidden world to life for us today. So uh, let's introduce Kate. Uh, let's bring her on screen uh, now. Let's get her down by my side here. Hi Kate, how are you doing all right? Hello, very good, thank you. Excellent. So uh, Kate is the uh, Plant Life's community scientist and tonight she's going to take us on a journey of discovery to find out what to look for on your next visit to uh, one of Dartmoor's woodlands uh, and also to find out what you can do to support uh, the work of the National Park and the support uh, the work of plant life with the conservation efforts. Uh, Kate is a community scientist and part of the plant life building resilience in the Southwest Woodlands team. And the project is funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund and it works closely with partners across the region. The project she's working on aims to conserve temperate rainforest with practical management and novel techniques and to share knowledge and run training with local communities. So Kate, we're really chuffed to have you uh, with us tonight. I'm uh, looking forward to uh, finding out a bit more about the, uh, the life in those rainforests. Um, it's five past seven, so I think I'm going to hand over straight to you, Kate, if that's OK. Yep, great. Thank okay, you. OK, let me just put you on uh, full screen and you've got the uh, the room. Great. Thank you very much for joining us this evening and thank you for the introduction. Um, so as Andy said, I'm from Plant Life. It is a national charity, but it's it's quite small. We have um, about 60 people dotted across the country, all the way up to the Cairngorms. Uh, we have projects in West Scotland, and then coming down the Lake District, uh, lots in Wales, 
And then uh, the furthest southwest is this project, Building Resilience in Southwest Woodlands. It's two years in. Um, obviously, we had a very interesting year last year, but we're still doing well. And we've got uh, just over a year left. We've had a bit of an extension because of COVID. Um, so we've just been given an extra few months to fit in a bit more that we were worried we were going to miss. Um, I joined the project uh, a year in and um, when I joined, uh, I was very familiar with Dartmoor. I've grown up in the area and spend uh, a lot of my weekends up there walking and enjoying being outside. But we would always generally in, um, not go to the woodland. We wanted to be up on the moor and we wouldn't go to any of the woodlands. So um, in the last year, I've visited some of the incredible woodland that we have on Dartmoor and started to learn more about the different special species that grow there. On this title page, I have put a fantastic photo of what we're calling temperate rainforest on Dartmoor. And when you look at it, you can see the boulders are covered in this luxurious moss and all the trunks and branches are covered in lichens. So hopefully some of you have seen this when you've been up on Dartmoor. So my aim for this session is I'm just going to do a very short introduction to our project. Uh, but then I'm going to spend most of the time telling you about some of the special species that if you go out uh, at the weekend, hopefully you'll be able to spot. And then at the end, I will tell you a little bit about uh, how you can get involved with the project as well. So as Andy said, the aims of the project is to conserve the region's temperate rainforest. And a big chunk of the money from the lottery has gone on to that. Um, so it's actually on the ground doing practical conservation uh, at different sites on Exmoor and Dartmoor, um, which includes things like uh, working on ancient woodland banks and bringing more light into the woodland. And then we also run uh, a series of different training um, available to different people in the area. Anything from uh, going out and doing a forest bathing session or um, run, we've been running them very intense uh, introductions uh, to lichen and mosses as well, where people have been learning how to identify using microscopes. There are three of us in uh, the team. This photo was taken last week and I'm right at the back with quite a grumpy face because I think this was the 10th uh, time we tried to get a photo of us all smiling. Um, but at the front is my manager, Rachel, and she's the project manager, but she doesn't just oversee the project. Uh, she lives in Somerset and is out regularly taking groups to the Quantox or on Exmoor to do forest bathing. And she works with a mental health group, the NHS. Um, the other person in the picture is Dr. Alison Smith, um, who started the project and she has a PhD in woodland management and is a specialist in lichens and mosses. Um, she went on maternity leave last year, so I came to fill her spot, but she's back now and we're working together to the end of the project. And then my uh, kind of background is um, as an ecologist, but also a teacher as well, used to teach in North Devon, um, and I'm a postgrad at Exeter Uni working on green space and mental health. So I put up another picture of some temperate rainforest because I really want you to get the kind of feeling of what it's like. It's not just uh, wet and humid and misty. Light is really important as well. And it's a real mosaic of features that you get in temperate rainforest. So temperate rainforest is rarer than uh, tropical rainforests that we uh, probably have all heard of, the Amazon and the Andes. Um, and it's only in a few places around the world. Um, so in Europe, we've got a bit of a stronghold in the west of Scotland, Lake District, Wales and down here. And then globally, there's some really interesting temperate rainforest in Northwest America, in Japan, in New Zealand. And if uh, any of you on Facebook, there are some fantastic lichen and moss groups um, and they put some beautiful pictures on from around the world. So um, yes, we're really lucky to have it here, but I would say 
also see what other parts of the world have as well, because there are some fantastic pictures that I see um, on Facebook of lichens in Japan, for example. In the southwest, we have a temperate rainforest a little bit in Cornwall. So um, on this map down at the bottom, number one is Lan Hydrock, a national trust site. And uh, they've got some temperate rainforests in their woodland. Uh, Galitha Falls down there as well is quite a good temperate rainforest example. Uh, North Cornwall, working all the way around the coast to North Devon and Peppercombe, have uh, some temperate rainforests. Um, on Exmoor, we have quite a bit, so Horner, Tar Steps, uh, we have some on Quantox, and then uh, Dartmoor. As you can see here in this picture, the dark green bit uh, is where the temperate rainforest is on Dartmoor. It's called an IPA, which stands for Important Plant Area, and this is a European term that um, we're using to kind of designate these special areas. And the IPA ZOO, which you might notice, the light colour, is where uh, we're calling it a zone of opportunity. So where we hope that there might be the conditions for temperate rainforest with better management as well. Um, obviously, looking at that, we all know parts of that is uh, large parts of that's open more. But where there is woodland, we're hoping there is the opportunity to extend into that area as well. And that map lies really well on this map, which is a rain hotspot. So you can see that uh, where the temperate rainforest is, is where the heavy rainfall is. And that's why parts like uh, down right in Cornwall don't have temperate rainforest, because there just isn't enough rain. So going back to some of these iconic pictures, the temperate rainforest um, is protected and special because it has very rare non-vascular plants growing there. So when we were at school, a vascular plant, your typical plant has roots and then it has a system for water and nutrients to travel up and down the plant. Well, lichens and bryophytes or the mosses don't have a vascular system. They don't have roots. They take in all of their nutrients through their leaves um, or through their kind of bodies that they have, but they don't have a root system. So that's really important. And in the temperate rainforest, we have some very rare species uh, that you can go and find on Dartmoor. But like many habitats, they are temperate rainforest has uh, facing many threats. Um, so woodland is very fragmented. If you think of the woodland on Dartmoor, not much of it actually connects up. Um, there's been a real change in management, particularly in the last 15, 60 years. We don't really get uh, traditional coppicing or pollarding. Um, we don't really have uh, animals coming in and grazing woodland. Um, I mean, we do in certain places. So Yana Wood has a herd of horses there or ponies. Um, but there has been a real change in woodland management over the last 50 or 60 years. Um, sorry, my cat. Uh, we have a real issue with invasive species. And if you go into woodland all over the country, there's lots of rhododendron. Um, and in some of the temperate rainforest in Scotland, they are starting a big project there to try and reduce the invasive species there. We also have ash dieback and, um, and also elms disease. So uh, lots of the woodland uh, in Devon has now got ash dieback affecting it as well. Um, we have issues with climate change. And I think we all know the last month has been incredibly dry. And uh, last week, again, I was in Yarna Wood and I went to some of the spots where I know there's some fantastic liverworts. And it's been so dry that those species aren't there anymore. They, um, they need the moisture and the humidity and it's gone. So lots of the species have dried up and they're not there anymore. And then we also have a loss of knowledge. So um, 12 years ago when I did my uh, ecology degree, we didn't cover lichens or bryophytes. Um, and 
I used to teach ecology to undergraduates as well, and it wasn't something that was on the curriculum. So there's a real loss of knowledge coming through with the next generations as well. So uh, lots of people ask me all the time, what is a lichen? And I think most of us will think of it potentially as that crusty thing that grows on a gravestone um, or you see it growing on a pavement. But they are so much more diverse than that and a range of shapes and sizes and colours. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit more about what they actually are. Lichens are what we call a composite organism. And that's because they're made up of more than one partner. We have the fungal partner, the fungus, and that provides the structure. And then we have uh, the photobiont. So that's the bit that photosynthesizes. And generally it's an algae or a bacteria. Um, the bacteria as well can be really important because they can fix the nitrogen. And there is quite a bit of new research now suggesting yeast is involved as well. So we're starting to see lots more research into lichens than there were before. Um, around the different properties it has, it, uh, lichens have interesting chemicals and compounds that um, protect them from the sun, um, that deter grazing. And we now have a lot more research going into those compounds to find out if they're useful for humans as well. In this diagram on the right, it gives a kind of cross section of a typical lichen. And uh, at the top is a part of the fungus. Then it's the uh, photobiont bit that photosynthesizes. We've got the algae here. And then it's more of the fungus that provides the structure. And then at the end uh, are these wiggly bits that say rhizines, and they aren't roots. So people always ask, oh, you said there weren't roots, but what are they? These don't take any nutrients from the tree. They are just a way of attaching um, and some lichens don't have them at all. So we have uh, three main growth forms for lichens. We have the bushy ones called fruticose. So some of you will probably recognise this one. Sometimes it's called old man's beard or beard lichens. We have the folios, the leafy ones. And we have the crusty ones or crustos, um, which I find particularly quite difficult to identify. We also use lichens as bioindicators. So they are really useful for ecologists to understand the environment that we're in. Uh, the one at the top is a yellow crustose lichen called Xanthoria. And um, when you know when you see it there, you'll find it on Dartmoor, probably in a car park, um, or you would find it in a coastal area because it tolerates nitrogen really well. And the lichen at the bottom we'll talk about a bit more, but it's called uh, tree lungwort, and it's an indicator of clean air and of an ancient woodland. Um, so if you see that growing, you're in an ancient woodland and it's an indicator of a really healthy place. So I'm going to tell you about some of the lichens that you will find uh, commonly on Dartmoor, but they're also indicators of temperate rainforest and clean air. So the first one's called Asnea articulata or string of sausages. And here it is. This is, uh, I took this actually on Arlington um, in North Devon in the car park. It was just growing everywhere, all over the trees. And uh, here's a closer up of it as well. So Asnea articulata um, or string of sausages is a very large lichen, uh, an indicator of clean air. And you'll find it growing on either high up in the canopy or on low, sometimes on low branches. It uh, trails down, it's this lovely silvery grey colour. But the important thing about string of sausages is these inflated like bladders that give it its name, string of sausages, that are constricted at little points um, as you go along. And all osneas, when you cut through them, um, when you take a like a cross section are circular 
but this is the only one with these inflated bladders um, that you will see. And it, as I said, it does go up high in the canopy, but you do find after storms it can fall down and um, that's where you're most likely to see it as well. Um, so if you go to places like Fingal Bridge uh, or on Dartmoor, um, New Bridge near Holne, there's lots of string of sausages there. Um, but generally I find it on the floor after a windy day. So um, this weekend could be uh, prime time because we've obviously had quite windy weather the last few days. Uh, the other Usnea that uh, I think is a really nice, easy one to identify is Usnea Florida. It has these large circular discs, um, which give it the common name, witch's whiskers. And uh, this is one of my favourite to take and show school children because they absolutely love it, particularly because it's called witch's whiskers. Um, but there is, you couldn't really mistake that for any other type of lichen. Uh, there's two types of Asnea florida, but they are both indicator species, again, of clean air. This one does grow right up in the top of canopy. It likes lots of light. So again, I generally find it uh, on the floor after some windy weather. The next one that we have is called tree languette or liberia pulmonaria and uh, I couldn't believe it the first time I saw this because I think of lichen as I said as this crusty thing that you would see on a graveyard but there was this really beautiful vivid green lichen um, and it's, it's quite large just growing happily on uh, the side of a tree. Um, so it is this lovely bright green um, when it's wet and moist, um, but it does dry out. So in the summer, it won't be this fantastic colour unless it's recently rained. But you can spray it with water and it will come back uh, over time to this lovely green colour. Um, I've put another photo here on the left of the underside. So you can see the underside is quite white. Um, and this is a very rare lichen. I wouldn't expect to just find it growing on every tree. Um, I now know a few spots where to find it, but it, it is quite a hard one to spot. Um, it's very fussy and it likes to grow on trees very close to the river. Um, it won't grow too low on the tree. So anything below chest height, you probably won't find it because slugs love it and they uh, will eat it all. They absolutely love it to bits, so just nibble it all off. Um, it needs the sun, but not too much sun, otherwise it will completely dry up and fall off. Um, but if it's too far around the tree, it will be outcompeted by the moss. Um, so it needs the humidity from uh, being close to the water and the canopy. It needs light, but too, not too much light. And it needs to be not too high up, but not too low. So you can start to put together the picture of where it might be and understand that it's quite fussy. Um, it grows very well on old oaks, uh, ash trees, hazel, uh, field maple and willow. Um, but I generally only find it on ash or hazel. And I've put in a map of its um, recorded distribution and you can see there's a lot up in the west of Scotland. And then down here we have a bit of a stronghold as well. Um, but as I said, it's if you went for a walk in the woods, it's not going to be on every single tree. You, you really have to go looking for it to find it. Um, but because of ash dieback, um, it's starting to lose its habitat. So we are working on a new method to try and help it, which some of you may have seen on Countryfile a couple of years ago. We had uh, Countryfile come down to film us doing some conservation on the tree languette, or it was recently in The Guardian um, to do with the Lake District and some of the work the National Trust are doing there. So what we've done um, on Exmoor and Dartmoor is where it's growing on a tree 
that has ash dieback and is condemned. Um, we've taken the tree down um, and then we've taken the tree lungwort off and put it onto donor trees with the hope that it would attach to those donor trees. So those trees were chosen very carefully because we knew it was the right pH bark and that they could potentially grow happily there. Um, we thought about where to position them on the tree, so not too low because of the slugs and not too high um, and not round the back, you know, being really careful. And uh, we've done a couple of hundred of these translocations onto donor trees and are now surveying them to see how well the tree lungwort has taken. This is a picture of a couple of them in situ because I get asked quite a lot, how do you attach them? Well, it's quite simple. We uh, carefully take a piece of the tree lungwort and then we use this plastic chicken mesh that we staple in the four corners to hold it in place. And then we come back uh, every six to 12 months to uh, see if it's managed to attach. And you do that by just gently lifting the corners to see if it's stuck on or not. And if it has, we can take the mesh away. Um, and at tar steps on Exmoor, we had a 80% attachment rate. And at Horner Wood, I think it's more like 90%. But some of the ones that have been put too low have had some nibbling. So we have to be careful about that as well from the slugs. Uh, another lichen that you uh, should see while you're out and about is called Sticta. Um, it again really likes very moist areas and uh, has a slight variation in colour. So I've got a brown one here, but you get kind of greys and blacks. Uh, but what's really important to look at when you see this is to check the underside because it is pale and it doesn't have any of these rhizomes, anything coming down underneath it. Whereas another lichen, which is very common on Dartmoor, called Peltigera, does. So we get lots of photos sent to us saying, oh, we found Sticta and it's actually the Peltigera. And you can see on this photo it has these rhizomes, um, these like threads coming from the underside. So if you find a lichen that has that, it's a Peltigera. If it doesn't, it's very much likely to be the Sticta lichen. And the last lichen I want to uh, tell you to keep a look out for is um, a green shield lichen called Flavoparmelia. Uh, I have to say it's quite common. You do sometimes find it in um, uh, woodlands that aren't temperate rainforests, but it is a really beautiful large lichen that's this apple green colour and I get sent pictures of it all the time from our volunteers because it's such a beautiful lichen. Um, and I think it's quite hard to confuse it with anything else because of this bright colour that it is. So hopefully you'll be able to spot that while you're out as well. And then I wanted to also tell you about bryophytes because uh, I've really found them fascinating over the last year and a half. Um, and it's really changed my walks on Dartmoor. I used to think moss was just moss and it was just this green stuff growing on the rocks. But I've learned over the last uh, year and a half how diverse the mosses are. And once you once you know that, you can't go back and it's really um, slowed down our walks because I'm like, oh, oh, stop. Let's have a look at this. So um, firstly, a bryophyte is the phylum name and it covers mosses, liverworts and hornworts. And they're some of the oldest plants on the planet, over 400 million years old. And they, too, are non-vascular plants. They don't have roots everything goes through their leaves, which are one cell thick. Um, I've just put here a photo of some of the ones that we have just to show you the diversity. So yes, they're all green, but they come in all different shapes and all different sizes. You can get some really big mosses growing on Dartmoor. So as a vascular, 
their cells are only, uh, sorry, their leaves are only one cell thick. As they are so old, they do have a very primitive method of reproduction and they rely on water. But they also do have spores. So sometimes you see these beautiful pictures of the spores coming up lit from behind and um, they do have spores as well. I do get asked a lot, why are mosses important? Why are you spending so much time looking at them? Um, well, they do contribute to our biomass in temperate rainforests. They do a lot to hold the banks back. So when you're in the temperate rainforest, you can see that they, they stop erosion because they kind of cover up the banks and hold the banks back, uh, stopping erosion from happening. And that helps in the water. Um, sphagnum is a um, moss that lots of ecologists have to survey and record, and they can hold uh, up to eight times their weight in water, but they're also quite an important carbon sink as well. And in the UK, we do have a significant proportion of the European biodiversity. Um, so as I said, ecologists will have to learn some of the uh, mosses because they're part of our surveys about the health and the status of the woodland. And like the lichens, they can also be bioindicators. So they can suggest the quality of the air and the climate and the woodland as well. So if you go on to Dartmoor uh, today, some of the common ones that you will find that are woodland mosses, uh, the first one I wanted to show you is the bristly one in this picture. It's called bank hair cap. Um, and you will see this in the woodland, uh, even in some of the drier parts of the woodland. It's quite resilient and it will grow in the wet areas all the way up to the drier areas as well. Um, but it's a really beautiful kind of star shaped moss from the top. Um, and as I said, it it actually has on top of its one cell, which is the bit going all around the bottom, it has uh, this thing called lamella, which are these specialised cells on top that stiffen up the leaf. So technically it still is one cell thick, but it does have these specialised cells and that allows it to be really stiff and capture as much light as possible. And when we uh, uh, take people out to learn about um, mosses on Dartmoor. This is always one of the tricky ones that people get stuck on because when you look through a hand lens, you can't see that. You can see that it's bright green and, it, and it's thick and you're like, it's not one cell thick, but it is. It's a tricky one. Uh, this one is my favourite. It's called fork moss or dicranium majus. And this is an indicator of temperate rainforests of ancient woodland and of good quality uh, habitat. So if you see this growing in a big, dense mat, you know you're in a fantastic woodland. Um, it is a very large moss and it kind of curves over in a kind of a fork shape and it is very beautiful. So each kind of strand can grow up to three to four inches long. Um, but yes, when you do see it, you're like, yes, I'm in a, in a fantastic woodland now. We also have uh, this one, tamarisk moss. It is a really interesting one because it is uh, the leaves divide three times. It's called tripinnate and it gives the moss this very fluffy, luxurious look about it. It grows in big, dense mats. So, um, you do find it in non-temperate rainforests, but you wouldn't get it in these big flushes growing on the banks. Um, and you can confuse it with one other species that has a red rib running up it. But this is this luxurious green colour growing in these big mats. And that again indicates you're in very good temperate rainforest woodland. And lastly on here, I've put a leafy liverwort, uh, which again, you can find uh, all over Dartmoor. Um, and liverworts are, are quite special. They uh, really need this moist, temperate woodland where there's lots of humidity. Um, you can see they look kind of wet on the surface. So I would 
find this probably growing very close to a river on the side of a riverbank. And uh, each kind of stalk, again, is quite long, kind of two to three inches long. Um, this is a plasiochyla, the one I'm showing you now. And again, it's an indicator that you're in temperate rainforest. Um, and until I started working on this project, I had never spotted them before. Um, I think you have to get your eye in and really look for them to see them. But um, now, if you go to uh, any really wet woodland on Dartmoor and go right down to the bottom along the river, you should be able to spot some of these growing well. Uh, and this species, Pelagiochyla spinulosa, spinulosa is the fact that it, I believe it's because it's toothed. Uh, again, it's very rare in the UK, but we do have a stronghold on Dartmoor and Exmoor, as well as, as you can see, the west coast of Scotland. Oh, and the last one I've put on here, uh, you should see uh, really commonly growing on Dartmoor woodland. It's called Frulania tamarisi, uh, and it's a beautiful liverwort under the microscope. So I have a photo of it here that a colleague took. Um, but this grows really well on older trees, uh, again, right by the river. And it has this really scaly brown appearance um, growing on the trees. So do keep an eye out for this one as well. So those are some of the species that I hope you'll be able to find uh, if you go out. And um, if you go onto our section of the website, um, if you Google plant life, building resilience, we do have some resources on there to help you spot some of those species. We also, like Dartmoor National Park, have a YouTube page and you can find some of our videos about those different species on there as well. If you want to get involved in our project, we are looking for volunteers to go out and do woodland surveys for us. They're called the Rapid Woodland Assessment. And top right, you can see our survey there. Um, and on the left are our videos that we've made to help people, particularly through the lockdown, um, do the different sections of the survey. Uh, uh, the Rapid Woodland Assessment is helping us find the different locations of temperate rainforest. Um, at the beginning, I showed you a map of where the known rainforest is, but we're already finding now there's lots of other parts of the southwest that have temperate rainforest that we didn't know about. Um, the survey is a really quick health check on the woodland as well. And it helps us engage with woodland owners and talk to them about the different species that they have there and some of the management techniques that they could introduce to their management plans to help those lichens and mosses. We have had over 200 submitted across the southwest. So on this map, each little purple uh, icon is where a survey has been done. And we've had some fantastic results come from that. So people have found lichens and mosses growing in places that we didn't know. And those have gone up to the record centre and all the different partners who are involved in the project. And we've learnt quite a lot as well. So 15% of those woodlands uh, surveyed have high scores for abundance of lichens and bryophytes. Um, however, we've also found that 80% of them have real dense undergrowth holly growing, uh, a third of sites have rhododendron and laurel, and a quarter of sites have dense regeneration of beech and sycamore. Um, but that helps us have conversations with woodland managers about different ways to manage their woodland as well. Uh, and just finally, about the survey, if you are interested, uh, you don't need any identification skills. Um, we ask you about the woodland uh, and there's a guide on there. So we want to know the, what age of the trees. We ask about habitat features. So do you see dead wood or boulders or water? Uh, we ask you about lichens and mosses, but not the species, just uh, the abundance. So is there luxurious growth of them on the boulders or not much at all? Um, 
We do ask you about four indicator species, um, but there's photos and they are the four lichens that I mentioned before and they were chosen because they should be nice and easy to spot. We ask you about any of the threats, so holly, rhododendron, uh, uh, Himalayan balsam, and we ask you for if you can see any management. So any uh, member of the public should be able to do the survey. You don't need any specialist skills, but we have made these uh, YouTube videos to help you as well. So I think I had 40 minutes and I think I've just hit that. Um, this is my email if anybody wants to get in contact with me. It's kate.hind at plantlife.org.uk. And we do have a Facebook page which has on it any training session or event goes on there. And um, I have to say, I, I'm not on Facebook, but for this project, it's been incredible. We um, would post I know, a training session and it would book up in the next few hours. So um, if you are interested in finding out about some of our training or next opportunities coming up, I would recommend our Facebook page as well. Andy, do you want me to stop sharing? Uh, no, I've um, I've swapped it now. So we, we are sat side by side now. Oh, OK. Excellent. So thank you. I, I jumped the gun a bit because I saw you were any questions. And oh, OK. I, uh, I went to that and you went, oh, I just want to check yeah. out my email address. Uh, so apologies to everyone. You suddenly saw me sort of flash up when you probably didn't want me to. Um, uh, thank you, Kate. That was fascinating, really exciting. It made me really want to get out and explore straight away looking for, for lichens and mosses, things that perhaps I might otherwise sort of walk past and, and ignore on my way to see flowers or the birds and things. So actually something else to look for. So my walks are going to get increasingly Please slow. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you were saying about how slow your walks are going. I can mm. imagine... I've got the birds to look at, I've got the flowers, and now I've got lichens and mosses and liverworts and everything to look. Um, if you uh, want to experience the dawn chorus out on Dartmoor, then uh, myself and John White from the RSPB went out a week ago, so there's a YouTube video of us uh, doing that, so you can spend 20 minutes uh, uh, listening to the birds, that'd be wonderful. We've also launched our Time for Nature Challenge as well, so if you look at the National Park websites, We've got our Time for Nature challenge, and that's all about, there's 45 challenges that you can pick and choose between uh, and try to sort of uh, find things to do to explore nature wherever you are uh, or out on Dartmoor. And hopefully we can do things together to look after that nature for the future. It's all about the 70th anniversary of the National Park. You see, we're 70 years old this year. So uh, we've got lots of things focusing on wildlife this year uh what else do i can i tell you i think that's probably enough isn't it from me it's enough uh so thank you uh, kate once again uh great to see you thank you to everybody there um who's out on the in the virtual world it's been lovely to uh, share your company this evening i agree better than the tv uh yeah right uh, thanks kate thank you everyone thank you uh, we'll all say good night good night is a moment where I find the button. There we are. Good night.